Thank you very much. Uh, hello, good morning, uh, and thanks for being here. We could have, of course, picked other sessions, but we're going to have some fun talking about feature hashing. Um, yeah, so I'm Gianluca, uh, and as mentioned, I'm a data scientist at Microsoft in Azure Cat as part of DI Lab, that's customer advisory service, um, or team, rather. Um, go out to customers and build up solutions for them with some machine learning uh, infused into it. So what we're going to be talking about today is partly inspired by some of the uh, work I've done in the last year and a half or so. I cannot mention any customers. Hopefully, our legal department will not come chasing after me for what I'm going to share with you, um, but should be all, all good. Uh, and I recognize a few faces, so I also do some teaching uh, General Assembly. I have my own company to do that. So if you've seen it before, hello again. So we're going to be talking about a few things. I'll start just with a very brief introduction of what the problem is. Uh, I have my one slide of what supervised machine learning is. And then just briefly talk to you about feature hashing. The ideas, some of them are uh, quite simple. I find some of them are a bit more complicated. Uh, and I'll present to you a use case, uh, which is an actual uh, project we delivered six months ago or so. And then we'll uh, close it by talking about library support in Python and in some other languages as well. Before we begin, I really should thank uh, th two people, uh, Sharat and Marcus are both in my team at Microsoft and they both uh, can introduce me to feature hashing and the obvious and less obvious tricks that I'm gonna share with you today. So thanks to them, they're watching on YouTube. And let's start with some background. So typically in supervised ML, you have one big matrix of predictors, which we call X, and then you have a vector, let's assume it's just a single outcome, uh, which we call Y. And if you're doing stats, typically you have a lot more observations than you have predictors, right? And this is kind of the assumption of traditional stats. And then what machine learning is, is you want to find the best estimator of some statistic, which could be the average value, for instance. That's not good, that's back. Um, for instance, the average value of y given the values for the predictors, and then you build that black box. You input the predictors, and it spits out the prediction, right? And for the sake of today, we're going to mostly be interested in linear models, or generalized linear models, where you have some function g, which is typically called link function, and then you have up here this x transpose, uh, sorry, this x beta, um, X is a matrix, beta is a vector of regression coefficients. So that's the linear part, right? That's the linear predictor. And then by changing G, you end up with a linear regression. If that's the identity function, you end up with logistic regression. If that's the, sigma, the inverse sigmoid function, you end up with a Poisson regression with some other assumptions. But the main problem is that you want to find estimates for that beta. So that's what the problem is. How you go and find them is, of course, uh, an entirely different talk, which I gave at PyData London last year, so you can go and, and look that up. Um, but that's, that's what there is to it. Now, the issue with that X is that very often you have categorical features. So you might have continuous features, and then for whatever reason you decide to bucket them. Age is a good one, right? We use age buckets rather than using age directly. You might do this in linear models because you assume that there's some nonlinearity, and so you want to discretize it. Then you have one not encoding, uh, which is common for categorical features. And if you're doing NLP, perhaps a bit old school, old school NLP nowadays, uh, you also have a bag of words representation. So we're going to talk about those two next. Imagine you have a data frame uh, with your country, and that's got the four countries that form the, the UK, England, Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland. Then suddenly from one column in your data frame, you end up with four columns you would probably exclude one, right? Otherwise, they're fully correlated. Uh, but you end up with four columns in your big predictor matrix X. Now, if you imagine that country was actually all 200 countries in the world, suddenly from one predictor, you end up with 200 uh, features that you then need to train your model on. And this problem is even worse if you're doing better words. Um, in this case, you have three sentences, which I called document. Uh, there's, there's three ladies, Ashley, Barbara, and Carol. Do memorize what they li like because there'll be a test later. So Ashley loves cats and she likes dogs. Barbara hates cats. I don't know how that's possible, but she loves dogs. And Carol loves both. So then you clean this up. You know, you tokenize and you make words lowercase and maybe you remove the names and 
uh, you have some stop words, and then you have, um, out of the three sentences, you end up with five predictors. And of course, this is a silly small example, but your dictionary explodes pretty quickly, given that there's a lot of words in, in human languages. So what's the problem with that, right? Uh, the problem is that the number of observations is fixed because that's your data set, so there's nothing we can do about that. But the number of predictors that you're going to use, the number of features that are going to go into your machine learning model depends on the cardinality of the features. If you have 100 words in your language that you observe in your documents, then you're going to have 100, well, 99 columns, let's say. If you have a country column that contains 200 distinct values, you're going to end up with 200 features, so that's big. And why is this a problem? There's two problems. The first one is for online learning. If you're training, imagine you have very large data sets, which is the case I'm going to show you later. You perhaps do not know how many words are in your dictionary to start with, or perhaps you do not know how many uh, unique, distinct categories you have for a, a column. So this requires you to do a first pass on the data set to understand how many there are, and then you can build up the dummy variables that way. And there's also, I guess this is more for the uh, statisticians amongst us, uh, when the number of features becomes uh, closer to the number of, of observations or, or surpasses it, uh, then this breaks traditional uh, estimation in, in the statistical sense. So these are the problems, and you might be thinking to yourself, well, I've heard of this before, right, in the neural network, because the neural network has a lot of inputs, like that picture of a slightly confused cat, and uh, each pixel becomes a predictor in your model, and maybe you have RGB values, or you know, so that's 1,024 pixels uh, squared times three, so there's a lot of inputs, then there's some magic AI in the center, uh, and this spits out a vector that predicts with 99% accuracy that that's a picture of a cat, right, and not of a dog. So this is similar, uh, because you have a lot of inputs, but it's fundamentally different in the aspect of sparsity, and the difference is that in something like my cat here, I don't really have a lot of zeros, right? I have values that encode the three different color channels or whatever, if you, depending on how you do it, of course. But I have a lot of values that are always present. If I have something like my country example, most of those um, values will be zeros, so there's a lot of sparsity. And this happens a lot. Uh, in fact, it happens in ad tech when you have users clicking uh, on ads on mobiles on websites. Uh, it happens in e-commerce transactions, uh, which is partly the example I'm going to show you. It happens in social networks where you have a lot of interactions, but most of the time people do not really interact. If you think of Facebook, you probably interact with a very small proportion of the entire user base. So this is the problem. And the idea is that we should be able to find a smaller x. And you could use PCA, right, or SVD or some other uh, linear algebra trick but they're not very efficient in terms of how long it takes to compute. And I'm always thinking of that online learning and I have a massive data set that I need to go through. I do not want to spend a lot of time doing this. Um, the other thing I do want is my number of features to be fixed. So I kind of know that the model size will be however much I specify. And I want to preserve the sparsity because this means I can compress my data down, right? I can only save the non-zero entries in my X matrix, which is good. So can we do this is um, the question, and of course you hear, so the answer is yes, and the answer is feature hash. Um, just to recap before we move on, uh, problem with categorical contextual features is that the number of features depend on the feature cardinality, and this uh, is often very large and kind of explodes sometimes without you noticing too much. So we want this more efficient sparse representation out. So let's see the trick. The idea with feature hashing is that you start with country equal to England, let's say, which was the first observation. Then you pass it to some magical H function, which will be the topic of much discussion in uh, this part of the talk. So you give it this country equal to England, and it spits out a number. How it does that, we'll chat about in a second. And then that number is a bit too big to use, so we need to reduce it down, because remember, we want a fixed model size. So we want uh, the index to be Let's say we want 100 predictors, right? So we can take modulo 100, and that gets us 11. This is all that feature hashing is. Of course, there's a lot behind it. Um, 
just to visualize what happens, you have, again, that data frame with country equal to England. I've computed here the using that same function, which we'll uh, talk about in a second. I've computed different indices. And of course, you have Scotland appears twice, and it gets mapped to the same index, right? Which is what you would expect. And then over here, you get your sparse x matrix. And it has 100 columns, right? But I'm only showing you the non-zero ones. So you can see the dummy variables effectively just scrambled around. So you might be asking, so well, it's the same as doing dummy variables, right? Just in a different order. Um, but that's more to this. Before we move on, uh, it's time and space efficient. I timed it uh, with the magic time it. And it takes roughly half a millisecond to hash one value. So I can do this very quickly. Uh, it is also quite space efficient because, of course, I don't need to save that whole row of 100 values. I can just save the position of the one that's in there. And the other thing, which I'm going to allude at just now, but we'll discuss later, is that I can compute this on the fly, right? I don't need to store anything in memory, really. P is fixed. It's still sparse, so it's beautiful. Now, that hash function uh, is inter interesting and something we need to uh, chat about. So H, in the theory, maps any integer input. So you can give it anything at all, and it will give you back as output an integer in some range, for instance, a 32-bit integer, which is what the function I'm using does. There's two properties which are quite important. The first one is that it should be uniform. So uh, it should get any, let's say you're using 32-bit integers, it should get as output any integer out. Uh, and you should also have this avalanche effect. So what happens here, uh, if you go and look at the ASCII representation of the character lowercase a and the character lowercase b, uh, c, they differ by just one bit. Um, but of course, the, uh, the, the hash function maps them to two entirely different values. So this is the important property. They need to be as random as possible, basically. So if you want to do this in, uh, in Python, there's a couple of packages. Um, there's one called PyHash, which interprets uh, or it has a lot more hash functions. MMH3 um, has something called MurmurHash3, which is the function I'm using here. So I, to compute my h, I pass to this hash function my string, some seed, which of course you should set to 42, um, and signed equal to false. That will come up later. Then I do my modulo, right? And I get out my 11. And then you can imagine doing a dot apply or something like that to do it automatically in to a pandas data frame or something similar. So we'll go through it line by line. The first one is actually line three, uh, where I'm not doing anything. But I said a moment ago that h maps any integer to another integer in some range, right? And of course, I'm passing it a string, which is a bit mysterious. Um, of course, any string can be represented and is, in fact, represented as a very large integer uh, in memory in our computers. The only thing I'm going to point out, because I was um, bit by this, so this happened to me not with German, which is my example here, but with some other uh, Eastern language. Strings and human languages in general are, are messy, very messy. Uh, you have two ways of representing the word uh, schön in German. The first one is by using the, this character, which is the letter O with an umlaut on top. And the second one is to actually have the letter O followed by a combination character for the umlaut, so the two dots at the top. When you print them out, they look the same, but they're not the same if you try and compare them which makes it quite complicated because the bit representation of the two is different. And so they hash the different values, even though they are the same. This gets much more complicated when you deal with non-Latin script. Um, there are some weird rules in there, which I will not bore you with. But the solution to this is to normalize. Most times, this is, this is enough. Um, it's a bit magical, but the uh, idea of using this normalized function from Unicode data, which is part of the standard library, is to just convert everything, in this case, to the second representation. And then you're happy. We know that everything is that looks the same on screen uh, is actually the same in memory. So this was more of an aside because I've been burned by it before. 
Second aside is that we had that module operator which reduces the size down from integer 32, right? Um, just very large numbers potentially, down to what we want. And I said, well, let's create 100 of them, 100 buckets. Now, if the hash size is a power of two, and why not, uh, right, you can do much better. So if you use the module operator and you time it with 128, then you get 81.3 nanoseconds. If you use the end with the size minus one, which is a kind of trick for modulo, uh, a power of two, then you get down to 57 nanoseconds. So it just saved you 30% of computation time uh, with one weird trick. So it's, it's quite amazing that this should work. Um, and this is again something that, if you look at the, at the timings, right, it's nanoseconds, who cares? But then imagine doing this um, millions and millions of times. So all adds up. Finally, what happens uh, if I have my function up there, right? I've just created that h function. Um, sometimes you will, simply because you're reducing down, so you're bucketing everything together, you get that if country is equal to United Kingdom or country is equal to Bulgaria, you will get the same index out. And this is known as a collision. So when this happens, um, well, of course, this happens more if that 127 is smaller because you're hashing a very large space down to something smaller. So you could always increase that, uh, but this will mean you have a larger model. And there is some impact on statistical performance. If you imagine that number six will be the seventh coefficient in your model, and that will represent both the UK and Bulgaria together. And maybe depending on what you're trying to do, this makes absolutely no sense, right? So this is a possibility. Now, interestingly enough, there's a lot of uh, studies that have been done on this and, and published papers on how much does this impact the performance of the model, uh, the statistical performance, right? And the answer is not very much, surprisingly. Um, so you can have quite a large amount of collisions, up to 50%, and the performance doesn't drop too much. It drops, you know, a couple of percentage points. So it's not too bad. The other thing that um, you lose, though, is the interpretability, because the nice thing of linear models is that you have a coefficient for the UK, and you can look at it, and you can say, well, this is the effect when countries equal to United Kingdom. In this case, you can't, because that coefficient in position or in index six corresponds to two, or in fact, it corresponds, I picked that one uh, going through a list of countries. There's, I think, another seven countries that hash to the same. So it's a large bucket that contains a collection of things, right? Now, one trick that you can use to avoid this uh, is to use yet another function, which in most papers is, uh, is called xi, so I've kept with the notation. And what you do here is a bit strange. So it's the same as before, but now this signed, I've switched to true. So this returns to me a signed integer. This 32-bit uh, in two's complement representation, and the first one is the sign and that's also random. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna return what we saw before in absolute value, then I pass it to modulo 128 with my trick, which gives me six. And the second bit that you see over here uh, just checks the sign. So if it's positive, then this will be true, times two minus one returns one. If this is negative, this is zero times two is zero, minus one is minus one. So this returns to me a plus one or minus one to indicate whether I should add or subtract to the bucket. So if you do this often enough with a lot of observations, on average, you're gonna get, some of them will be uh, positive, some of them will be negative. They will cancel out in expectation, and this uh, we'll see in my example, so that collisions do not add up in a sense, but they cancel each other out. Statistically, uh, is perhaps a better idea. So you can think of H in two ways. Uh, the more mathematical way, I guess, is it maps any integer input, and anything in a computer really is an integer, right? Onto another integer in some range, 32-bit, 64-bit, doesn't really matter. Or if you're thinking more as a computer scientist, you can think that what H does is it looks at the bits, it scrambles them up, but in a fashion that's deterministic, so it's reproducible, and then produces a bitmap which is fixed length, so you go from very large, potentially very long piece of text down to something which is, say, an integer between one and, uh, well, zero and 127. 
The other thing I wanted to point out again is that really the impact of collisions uh, is not too large. And we've done some experiments on this uh, with customer data and we kind of see the same that's published. You can go up um, to two or three collisions per bucket and that seems to be fine. So let's do an example. Maybe this will make it clear. Here they are, Ashley, Barbara and Carol have returned. And what I'm trying to do is understand whether they like movies. And of course, there's dog movies and cat movies and dog and dog and cat movies like the Aristocats, which also contains dogs. So I've got my, I, I, I don't necessarily agree with the choice of movies, but this is the data I was given. So you've, you've got my user, ABC, uh, four different movies, and then these two indicator variables tell me whether the movie contains cats and dogs, and the rating is what they rated the movie out of five, right? It's a kind of IMDb-esque example. So this is the data I get out, and of course, if I were to create dummy variables, user expands into three, right? Movie expands into four. These two dummy variables are the same. The rating is uh, our Y, so it's our outcome, and that gets excluded out. So what I'm gonna do instead is I'm gonna apply my hash function to this. And if I do this, you can still see the structure, right? Uh, this is Hashley, this is Barbara, this is Carol. You can see the movies being repeated, and then some of them, um, of course, will, will end up in different positions. There are no collisions just yet. Got my cats and dogs variables, and this becomes a huge, huge matrix um, with 128 columns, which is mostly sparse. And I've got some plus uh, ones and minus ones due to that trick with the sign that I presented to you a second ago. So then I start and I pass this to my model and uh, sorry for the slightly R inspired formula that uh, I find it easier to think about the model in this sense. So what I'm gonna say is the rating is a linear function of the user, the movie, whether uh, the movie has cats and whether the movie has dogs. So I'm trying to build some sort of recommendation system, right? And if you think about it for a second, that user, so having one coefficient per user, tells me the average effect. In a sense, this, is, this user tends to rate movies, irrespective of the movie, roughly 3.5 stars, right? Then you have a second effect for movie, which is irrespective of the user, this movie tends to get rated around four stars for whatever it is. And then you have some more average effects for movie-related features, like cats and dogs. First one, let's say, the second one is the same, so has cats. The coefficient for that feature tells me, in general, uh, what the average rating for movies that have cats in them is, right? And same thing for, for the dogs. So there's no recommendation. It's not very nice, but we can fix that. We can add some interaction terms. So we have the same thing. We have the average effect of the user, the average effect of the movies, but now we also have a coefficient for whether the user likes movies that have cats in them or whether the user likes movies that have dogs in them. And now suddenly this becomes uh, much bigger because of the interaction terms. So when you have feature hashing, there's a nice trick uh, that you can apply. So if you have two hashes, like let's say I want to determine where I should put the coefficient for Hashley uh, and a movie having cats in them, I already know what the hash value is. Uh, it's two with a negative sign and it's nine with a positive sign. So I can combine them again. This should have been centered, sorry. Um, I can combine them again. This is another hash function known as f and b1a. I can reduce them down to my space and then I can just take the product. So I can use yet another hash function to determine what the bucket for that coefficient should be. And it happens to be 81 with a negative sign. So if I go back here, I've now created my interaction terms. And in this case, you have um, Hashley rating a movie with cats. So I get an interaction term between her uh, user in two and uh, the movie having cats in nine. And that's the 81 that I just showed you. And then you can do the same thing and redefine all your variables like so. Now you do get a collision, right? At some point, um, this has dogs, which we had before. 
clashes in the same position, 110, with uh, whether Barbara, I think it is, likes cats. So the coefficient for that interaction. So these two will cancel out. One is negative, one is positive. This is the sign trick uh, doing its magic. And so they will just be cancelled out. And this carries over in this representation over there. If it is into a model, of course, you need a few more observations for this to really work. Uh, and you get out a model where you can make recommendations from. So it's time and space efficient, um, which means you can do online learning. Everything can be done on the fly, right? You do not need to store anything at all. The indices can be computed on the fly. It preserves sparsity, which is not necessarily what happens uh, with, let's say, a PCA decomposition of, of X. And the other thing I didn't mention, but it's, uh, it's quite cool, is that it implicitly handles missing data. If you do not have a piece of information, then it hashes to zero and it's just gone. Collisions are a problem, uh, of course. They don't impact statistical performance too much, but they do. So that's something you need to consider and, and look into when you uh, create a model with feature hashing. And the other issue, I guess, if you care about interpretability is how you're gonna reverse back. So that coefficient doesn't represent one particular feature. It represents potentially an infinite number of them, uh, right? But at least in your training data, due to the collisions, it will represent a bunch of them together. And so we'll be affected by all of them together. So let me show you how I use this uh, in recent times. The scenario was a business directory, uh, think Yelp, but not in the States. And what they wanted to do is that they wanted to improve the relevance uh, of search results. You kind of go there and say, well, I want an Italian restaurant in central London, and it will spit out a number of results from an elastic search instance. Now, they also wanted to personalize because maybe I look for Italian restaurants and I really like cheap Italian restaurants, right? Or upscale Italian restaurants. And so you want to uh, re-rank the results to be more relevant to the query, but also to the user. So can break this down into two. Um, the relevance really means you want to optimize the click-through rate. So if I look for Italian restaurants and there's a French restaurant, no one in, in the results, no one should click on that. So I should uh, bubble up the Italian restaurants to the top. But I also want to personalize. So as I said, if I've previously contacted or looked at cheap Italian restaurants, then maybe you should recommend to me the same. Or if I look up a French restaurant, then you should take into account the fact that I don't go for the most expensive restaurants normally and not show them to me uh, at the top of the search results. So this is the kind of data uh, that we had. Some user, there's the query, and then there's several businesses, right? Uh, one of them is the famous French restaurant, it's the second one. So no one clicks on that, uh, and you have some clicks. This was roughly 350 million uh, observations in that big X matrix, and you have a lot of attributes for the businesses when they're open, what cuisine they serve. This is not just restaurants, by the way. So you have a lot of uh, different and sparse attributes out. So this is the model, uh, and it's the same as before, right? There's the average effects. For the user, how much do they click in general? For the query, how frequently um, is that query? Then can we answer it for the restaurant, in this case, or for the business? Same story. Then you get the correction for the relevance. Is this query appropriate for the business? So you would imagine that if I look up Italian restaurant, and this is an Italian restaurant, even though I do not know that, people click on it, and so I should be able to learn that that's a relevant result for my query. And opposite for the French one. And finally, for the user, it's the same story. If a user clicks on things, uh, let's say, have a price range of low, then we're gonna learn that that's what they like. So you get personalization and you get re-ranking for relevance pretty much automatically. This was uh, with a very large hash, hash size in the end, uh, roughly eight and a half million coefficients. So this ran on SparkML for a while. Uh, as a regularized logistic regression with an elastic net. It runs for a few hours and then you get out your model and can make recommendations out of it. Works incredibly well. Uh, based on the train test split, we estimated around a 5% increase in click-through rate and we got uh, roughly 10% in A-B testing. So this uh, worked pretty well overall. Customer was very pleased. So that was good. And um, more recent project used something very similar for news recommendation, which again, you can decompose into, do they like sports news? And 
all sorts of things. And they've, we're seeing similar results with, with that as well. Last thing I want to uh, chat about is how you do it uh, very briefly. And the reference implementation is in a software called Vapor Wabbit DW. It's in C++, but you've got Python bindings, also due to one of my colleagues, uh, actually. You can do linear logistic Poisson regression. You can create interactions on the fly. Uh, it's very fast, uh, and you can scale it up. Um, it processes a few million observations per second, so you can train huge models with this. Some support in scikit-learn, learn, not too much. Uh, there's a feature hasher, there's a hashing vectorizer for text transformation. It kind of does the same as count vectorizer, but with the hashing trick included. Um, there's no interactions at present, and this is maybe something I will be working on next. Uh, and in Apache Spark, you get some support. Uh, there's some PySpark transformers that I have written for the project I talked to you about. Um, those are on GitHub, and we also we're also currently working on bindings to Vapor Wabbit. So those are coming soon to MML Spark, which is the Microsoft Machine Learning Library for Spark. And I've included links to all of this uh, on the GitHub page for this presentation. So you can go for that. So to conclude, it's great, uh, especially if you have a lot of data uh, and you want to do online training. Don't have to do online training, of course. With you know, we've done this with uh, Spark and it works just as well. It really works well when you have high cardinality features that would explode typically, right? They would become huge uh, matrices of, of predictors. And it works even better if you have interactions. Of course, you could decide to not use linear models. You could use an SVM, you could use any, any sort of thing. Um, but if you're doing interactions and whatnot and also the online training, you're somewhat limited in the type of models you can use. So that was it for me. Thank you very much. And if you want to keep in touch, please do. Questions? I should add whilst you get the mic there. Um, you'll find the slides and some links on my GitHub as well, and I've linked them for the page. So you can find all of that stuff. Uh, hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I was wondering if you've experimented around, say, the performance of using hashing mm -hmm. for categorical variables, in, or th there's another technique, entity embeddings, where you, where you learn embeddings, uh, fixed dimensional representations together with the model end-to-end. Uh, -end. I guess that would yep. apply more to neural networks. Uh, have okay. you done any experiments with that? Uh, we have for that particular project in particular, both, uh, as, you, as you mentioned, just train and embedding and kind of end-to-end. Uh, and also train an embedding and use the resulting vectors as features in the bigger model. Um, I've, the, the performance is, is all right. Um, I still find that VW is much faster and you can build features pretty much on the fly. So the, the memory usage is effectively zero. Okay, thank you. Uh, hi, thanks for the talk. Is is that approach something that could be or should be easily integrated into the existing uh, gradient boosting libraries uh, where you don't actually need to go through the one hot step? Mm -hmm. oh, excellent question. I have experimented with um, this kind of approach and then either random forests or gradient boosted trees. And in fact, it wasn't, for, for this particular problem at least, it wasn't any better than the logistic regression with the interactions. I would hope and imagine that if you didn't use interactions, maybe a tree-based model would be able to learn them. So you could definitely use the same approach um, just to kind of bound the, um, the size of, of your X matrix. Um, but I've not really seen great results out of that. Thank you for the talk. And quick question about the sign beat, uh, because uh, in many libraries like scikit-learn, you can use it or you can disable it. Do you think it's a good idea to, to like use the sign or, or do you have any like guidelines wh when this signed hashing is better than, than without sign? Mm, I've had a long discussion with this with the two guys that I thanked <laughs> at the start. Um, I think VW does not use it and we try both with and without and there's very little difference to be honest. The statistician in me likes the fact that 
the sign interaction cancels out in expectations. So the statistician says yes. And it doesn't cost any more computation. So. All right, that's thanks. Let's try and look again. Thanks again.